The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Business Channel. For more information about our network and to check our additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericabusiness.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the following program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Game On! Business Talk Radio with your host, Dr. D. Anthony Miles. Our program is not afraid to discuss the more controversial business ideas and topics. Get ready for an unfiltered discussion of problems and solutions that today's businesses, large or small, face daily. Now, here is Dr. D. Anthony Miles. Hi, good morning. This is Game On! Business Talk with D. Anthony Miles. We have an awesome show for you today. Get some coffee and have a seat. You're going to need a Bible and a seat belt. The topic for our show today is the Zimmerman Verdict, a perspective from African-American female scholars. And uh, let me give you some background on this particular show. We have all heard about the Zimmerman trial and the verdict. And I wanted to get a perspective from uh, African female scholars and get their perspective on what they thought was going on with the trial and what some of the things that they saw that stood out to us. Let me give you a brief uh, background on this. One of the things about the Zimmerman verdict, it's been one of the most controversial criminal cases in the history of the American justice system. There is a global outrage at the verdict of this trial. So some of the questions that we're going to talk about today is, has the American justice system failed in this case? Has the justice system or the jury system failed in this case as well? And lastly, is there a message being sent with the verdict in the Zimmerman trial? So we'll bring in our experts. I'm going to read you their bios quickly. Our first guest is uh, Bren Burkowski. She is CEO and director of C4C Kaleidoscope. Her specialties are in law, criminal justice, psychology, counterterrorism, peace and conflict, and uh, crime prevention, and also hostage negotiation. Her experience lies in the field of criminal justice, law, mental health, peace and conflict studies, and higher education and lobbying. Her education background is she has a JD from the University of Maryland School of Law, an MA in Counseling and uh, Mental Health from St. Mary's University, and a BA in Political Science from John Hopkins University. Our second guest is Dr. Sharon Michael Chadwell. She is a professor and a higher education professional and a researcher. Her experience is in both K-12 education and higher education programs. She is an expert in African-American male education programs and academically rigorous programs. Her latest publication in her upcoming uh, book is Frameworks and Models of Black Male Success, a guide for P through 12 and post-secondary educators. She has 20 years experience in the uh, education sector. She has published her research with various journals, most specifically Journal of Education and the Gifted, in the National Journal of Urban and Education Practice and some other journals. Her education background, she has a doctorate in educational leadership from the University of Phoenix. She has an MA in Human Resources from Webster University, and she has a BA in Elementary Education from the University of Texas at San Antonio. Our last guest is Dr. Velma Gooding. She is a professor and researcher of marketing in the School of Business and Leadership at Our Lady of the Lake University. She is an expert in the field of ethnic and minority marketing. Dr. Gooding has conducted research around the world. Her most notable research is she uh, conducted some research in Africa or in South Africa. She's conducted research in India and China. She was awarded the the, uh, spring 2010 Hearst Award for her research in France. She was awarded a grant from the American Marketing Association valuing diversity for her research that she conducted in France. And lastly, she's conducted research and also presented at conferences around the world. She has a PhD in advertising from the University of Texas, Austin. She has an MA in journalism and mass communications from Iowa State University. And lastly, she has a BA in journalism from Hampton University. I want to welcome our guests today. We got an A team of guests, and I want to say, ladies, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you this morning? Great, wonderful. Awesome. How are you doing? Okay, 
I'm just uh, just uh, admiring your work, and I just want to tap you as a resource for our discussion today. Let me uh, get right into our discussion today. Uh, I want to ask you, and uh, you can all come in one at a time, what did you think of the uh, Zimmerman verdict? Well, for me, this is uh, Dr. Gooding, Velma Gooding. Okay. And Dr. For me, Gooding, go ahead. For me, I was, I, it was somber. Um, in fact, I was on vacation in Florida, um, when I, we watched parts of the trial, and I even passed through um, Sanford, Florida, when we were just uh, driving through, and it was oh, a gut blow. It was a, it was it was it was very somber. In fact, I looked on Facebook. I was uh, looking on Facebook and and looking in my Twitter and Facebook and everything, and it was it was a pow in 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 the stomach. And not just me, for me, but it was for many of my Facebook friends, um, especially the, well, the majority of my African-American friends on Facebook or followers of Twitter. Um, it, was a, a, it was a pow in the kisser. It really was. Goodness. Dr. Burkowski, I'm sorry, Dr. Chadwell, what's your, what's your uh, take on it? What, what was your personal feelings about the Zimmerman verdict? You know, I, I really was not prepared for the outcome of this verdict. I, I, I was maybe I was hopeful that we have moved beyond race in terms of making judicial dis- decisions. As a black, uh, as a mother that has a black son, I was I became more fearful in that it's enough to where you worry about him coming back in one piece after being out at night. But it kind of almost justified the fears that I already have about the safety of my son and any other African-American male. Um, One of the things that really came to mind was that uh, Brown versus the Board of Education was was a little over 50 years ago, but we still have only made inches of improvements in regard to race relations and decisions regarding race. So it it, it was a – I was very, very disappointed in in the entire system. Oh goodness, Dr. Burkowski, what's 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 your feelings on the verdict? So share with us your opinion. All right, um, you can you can call me Brenya during this interview. By the way, um, okay, I would prefer that. Thank you. Uh, when the verdict came out, what I did was I before it came out, when I saw that CNN was talking about it, I first said to my husband, I first turned to my husband, I said, "What do you think the verdict will be?" In in terms of thought, and he told me what he thought it would be, and then I told him what I thought it would be. And then we turned the mute button on the TV, and sure enough, the verdict came out to be what we both thought it would be. And um, that's because of the challenges that exist within our legal system. And because of the, unfortunately, because of the work I do, and because of the teaching that I do in the classroom over the years, um, we both were on the same mind of what we thought the verdict would be, unfortunately. So that's, that was my thought of what would happen. And from that thought, I have a lot of opinions, personal opinions, um, and then classroom opinions. Now, my feeling is different from my thought, and given that I'm in psychology, you know, thought and feeling is very different. My feeling was then to reach out to my son, because my son just turned 24 years old, and he's an African-American young man. Um, and when I turned to him, my feeling was gut-wrenching um, as an African-American woman. And I'm originally from the continent of Africa, by the way. And he, um, his response was in thought was actually similar to my husband and I. So um, that's what I can say as an introduction. I can say for me, and uh, I don't know why, I, I don't know if I was just bracing myself for the inevitable, but I know that I was sick for three days when I heard the verdict. I heard the verdict Saturday night, probably as some of you did. And, and I think I had this feeling that it would end up in a uh, not guilty verdict, but for me to actually see it was probably more traumatic Mm -hmm. in terms of, because I actually got sick. I got sick for like three days, and then I kept racking my brain going, I'm looking at a teenager who was minding his own business, and a guy just went up and killed him. 
And I have my thoughts on what actually happened. And if you guys want to tell me what you think actually happened as opposed to what was said in the case, please. Uh, Dr. Gooding, what do you think actually happened? Well, you know what? I, um, I'll give you, my, I guess, my professional opinion now. Um, it was the incarnate of my uh, research. Before I started doing research on um, studying emerging markets, for 20 years now, I have studied um, racial stereotypes and the origins of them and the effects on opportunity. And, and that included also consumer racial profiling, which is disparate treatment in retail settings of um, people based on race. Um, and that night, Trayvon Martin, which is, who is a child, he is a child, and that's one thing in the case that they didn't say enough for me that he was a child. But he right. walked back from that store in the rain, and he was a victim of implicit associations and automatic responses, which is something that I've studied. Um, and those, are res- those automatic responses that George um, Zimmerman, um, that came up in George Zimmerman, they are rooted in stereotypes that are residuals from slavery. And the first images of race in media um, were slave posters and runaway slave posters and also uh, wanted Indian posters. And those images um, progress to images of African Americans and other people of color that were dark, in image, um, dark menacing images of uh, criminals in movies and commercials. And um, that people who are of color are responsible for negative social ills, they're committed characters or sexualized images, or they drain society, um, they're, they're criminals, um, just really negative images. Um, and these, in fact, uh, in my research, I found that um, there was always a fear of a white backlash of 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 against brands in a, in advertising that if you use positive images of African Americans that um, white people would not buy brands and this was b- back in the days early days of advertising so there was Are always negative images used wow. of African Americans um, and so what happened was these images have been socialized within our culture in America that to believe that dark skin equals negative and unequal. And if you don't believe me, there's um, something called the IAT test, which is the Implicit Association Test, and you can Google it. Um, and uh, it can show you privately. And, and, and any of your listeners can listen, you Google it, and privately they can test, take the Implicit Association Test at home, and it can show you how ingrained within each of us Subconsciously, are these images um, of how we feel, and and we have automatic responses really easily accessible to us about skin color. Well, what happened was this is why Trayvon was followed in the first place, and this is also why um, Attorney General Eric Holder was pushed up against the wall when he talked about the talk in the NAACP just the other day when he was running in D.C., when he was, a federal, when he was a, a federal attorney, when he was just pushed up against the wall by um, police officers in D.C. for just running for a movie in the wrong neighborhood in D.C. And this is what President Obama was talking about, why he was followed in stores. And even I have been followed in stores or not seated in restaurants based upon me being African-American, although I am a lighter-skinned African-American woman, um, who can sometimes be ethnically ambiguous, but I have not been even seated in restaurants or I have um, been followed by police officers for driving my car in a nice neighborhood. So we live in an alternative universe, and we, um, even as professionals with PhDs, don't even discuss this really openly um, with our white friends because it is a certain pain. But this is uh, an alternative universe, and this is an experience started in um, slavery, and it has been perpetuated over generations by media, and it has reminded people throughout time who belongs where in the hierarchy of society and the value of some lives over other people's lives. And this is basically why people are demonstrating in the streets today, and this is basically, I think, why we are reacting to this case the way we are and why we're saying, you know what, enough is enough. Enough is enough, and this is basically, I think, the crux of the of the case. And so, this is my worst nightmare in terms of my research. Um, it's the incarnate of my research, of what happens with opportunity and what happens in everyday life when um, 
the uh, incarnate of uh, negative stereotypes as they were rooted in slavery. And now we see what happens. Opportunity and then also death. And also we have those um, stop and frisk procedures that are going on in New York and other states, and uh, among other things. That is pretty riveting information. Uh, uh, Bryn, what do, you, what do you think about that? What do you, um, what do you have to add to that? What, I, um, I, I support what she, um, she described. That is, Dr. That is Gooding? Accurate. Yeah, absolutely. I support what she described, Dr. Gooden described. And there's psychological research that backs that up. What with, um, um, in layman's language, the doll research that we've done with different races, which doll they choose and which doll the children, the young children, Mm -hmm. decide is the good doll or the bad doll. And the bad doll with a high percentage is chosen to be the darker complexion doll, um, the black complexion doll and the white doll is considered the good doll. It's heartbreaking. And this is socialized and conditioned in our children at a very young age through um, visual conditioning within the United States of America. In the continent of Africa, sub-Saharan African, that is not the case. But within um, other continents, that would be the case. Now, Um, I would like to add to that in terms of the jury, because within our system here in the United States, the jury is very important. Our system legally is a a very strong legal system, um, generally a very effective one that doesn't work very well with the disparities amongst our African-American population, because as we know, there are too many disparities within the criminal justice system, what with the death penalty, what with um, drug cases, Brent, can you hold yeah. that thought? We have to take our first break, and then we'll, we'll come okay. right back to you and Dr. Chadwell. This is Game okay. On Business Talk. We'll be right back. The business community's first choice in Internet talk radio, Voice America Business Network. How can we Americans realize our dreams to earn a living? How can you pursue your dream and make money as an owner or an employee? Learn how at The American Business Person, the online weekly radio talk show hosted by Rich Killian. Today's business leaders share how to succeed and what fails. If you own a new or established business or ever hope to, you must tune in. Join us every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 p.m. Central, and noon Pacific on the Voice America Business Channel. Or listen on demand to our archived shows. Today, enterprise technology is both strategic and global. Each week on CIO Talk Radio, IT thought leaders from around the world share their experiences with listeners as they discuss with Sun Jog All how they are trimming costs and partnering with business to innovate and help IT become more competitive. This means better care for customers and improves the corporate bottom line. If you want to keep up with IT thought leadership, listen to CIO Talk Radio with Sun Jog All every Wednesday at 7 a.m. Pacific Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Business Channel, the bottom line in business talk. Are you a business innovator or are you just sitting on the sidelines? Tune in every week for Coffee Break with Game Changers, presented by SAP. Host Bonnie D. Graham talks to a cross-section of the movers and shakers who are leading by example. They will share best practices and innovative ideas to keep you thinking and moving along with the best. Join us for Coffee Break with Game Changers, presented by SAP, Wednesday mornings at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Business Channel. We're always talking business. Talk to an expert. Call now, toll free, 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Voice America Business Network. You are tuned in to Game On Business Talk Radio with Dr. D. Anthony Miles. If you have a question or comment on today's program for Dr. Miles or his guest, please call in to 1-866-472-5790. That's 1-866-472-5790. You may also send an email to GameOnTalkRadio at Yahoo.com. Now, back to the program. Hi, we're back. This is Game On Business Talk with D. Anthony Miles, and we're going to continue our discussion on the uh, Zimmerman verdict 
with uh, Dr. I'm sorry, Bryn Burkowski, uh, Dr. Sharon Chadwell, and Dr. Velma Gooding. And I, we're at the break, we uh, were last talked with uh, Bryn Burkowski and her feelings on the Zimmerman verdict. Go ahead, Bryn. Um, I, I was tagging on to what Dr. Gooding was speaking about, um, the effects, and us talking about the psychological effects with the jury. Um, I wanted to bring up Miss Rachel Gentile, and many yes. have been describing her as a young woman. I describe her as a teenager. She's 19 years old, and I think it's fair to say she's a teenager, and I think she did very well as a teenager. And she's, she's still in high school, and many have not said that. And she was the ear witness to her friend, as she describes best friend, our Trayvon Martin. Mm-hmm. And what I would like to say is that when she is a witness who did very well, a key witness, understand, and Don West was speaking with her. Mm-hmm. She had a marked, of course, a marked effect on the jury. And one effect that she had, which has not been spoken about or thought about, was that she was standing in the place of her friend, Trayvon Martin. And that's what I'd like to describe, that as the jury watches and listens, a psychological effect takes place. And that effect is the jury is watching her and through her words and her body language and her affect, the jury is getting a sense of whom she's describing as her best friend, Trayvon. And we, we need to um, extract from that what she herself said that Trayvon Martin, another teenager who was 17 years old, a child, in the state of Florida, minor, he, he was definitely not Rachel. He was a boy. He was not a girl. Um, Rachel describes him as very much a loving boy, a family boy. And, of course, he was in his daddy's neighborhood. Um, he was going to get some candy, and some, a snack, um, in the rain, in the dark. And as our President Obama said, um, he 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 had every reason to be there, and as the prosecution said, this would be any child's worst nightmare to be followed home in the dark by a stranger, and this was the child. Yet the jury, as they're looking and watching her, the best friend, they get a different impression of who Trayvon is. And we know the composition of the jury, the ethnic composition of the jury, although they tried to say this was not a race issue as they're watching her representing in all ways psychologically who Trayvon was. And that had a marked effect on them. And then the jury member, I believe it was jury member B37, who came out yes. and spoke with Anderson Cooper yeah. um, prematurely, for even she, she admitted it was premature because she changed her mind later on. She said that they dismissed, they decided to dismiss Rachel's testimony on the witness stand. I find that fascinating. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and, and she wasn't trustworthy. And, and, yet she was, and yet she was very authentic. Everyone agreed later on that she was very authentic. She was consistent. She did not change her, her coding. And coding means that um, language coding in, in generally within different ethnic groups we, within the United States of America, we change our coding to yeah. adjust. So she we- was one that was consistent and did not change her coding which shows great genuineness and authenticity. She didn't do that, which shows her credibility to the jury, yet they dismissed her. I was, uh, I was shocked when I heard B-37 say some of the things that she said. And I wanted to ask Dr. Chadwell, uh, what did you think about uh, the jury, uh, the, the uh, makeup of the jury, piggybacking on what Bren said? What, what's your opinion on that, Dr. Chadwell? You know, I was very, you know, again, you know, we keep hearing a jury of my peers, a jury of my peers, a jury of my peers. Was that truly a jury of his peers in terms of ethnic makeup, uh, community makeup? Uh, They were all women. Uh, What type of experiences did these women have in relation to African-American men in that community? Uh, Looking at the jury and Following back on what Brenya was saying about the authenticity uh, of Rachel, this is talk about her. Uh, she was dark. Mm-hmm. Her hair was ethnically worn. You know, it wasn't straight perm or anything else. She wore it ethnically. 
She had mm-hmm. big lips. She had uh, uh, she was she wasn't eloquent in her speech. So right. I can't help but think that they dismissed her because she did not have the the presence or the stereotypical presence of a of a of a witness. And so uh, again, race or images of race dismiss her entire um, testimony. So we, we've got this going on still in the, in the United States. And then the other thing I've been thinking about, and I'm kind of steering away a little bit from the conversation, is that this goes back to 1955 on the murder of Emmett Till, right? Yes. The jury was all white men. This was an 11-year-old child. Oh, who, my supposed, goodness. who supposedly was flirting with the, a white cashier in a grocery store, got beaten and shot in the head based on uh, perceptions of misbehavior. Trayvon, Trayvon basically was, is our Emmett Till. Yes, when it he, is. Yes, he, Absolutely. He, he is our Emmett Till. When Emmett Till died, the mother had an open casket where she told the funeral home to not reconstruct his body to make him more appealing. She wanted the community to see what racism does and what it has done to our African American boys. So we've got we've got these images of racism again in the court system and for African American males, even in the even from, from the education sector to the business sector there are still these images based on what they can and cannot do, going back to what Velda said, uh, on different levels of skin colors, because we still have, you know, if you're too black, mm, if you're high yellow, you know, thumbs up. So we still have these images issues, this this social programming that is still going on. So I think that I can't help but think that that social programming was not imminent when they put Rachel up on the stand. Right. Absolutely. Had I was going to... Go ahead. Of, go ahead. Had one of us had known a fan, Trevon might have had a chance. But because they picked mm-hmm. up, you know, this young lady who was, as I say, from the hood, you know, they really dismissed her. And then the fact that she was penalized when she said she couldn't read. You know, I remember seeing that, and I and and and, and immediately what I thought was they're trying to immediately stereotype that young lady, mm-hmm. and uh, yes. I think what even is even more disturbing is, and, and I think along the lines of I don't know if they're going to do a civil suit. I I don't know if that's going to be fruitful. But what I think what needs to happen is you need to watch the homogeneity of a of a jury makeup. You can't have all one ethnicity on a jury trying to uh, make a decision on a case with somebody who is not of the same ethnicity. Because I think that's where one of the biggest problem lies. When I heard the jury makeup, I was immediately suspicious. And when I heard the gender makeup, I was immediately suspicious. But I want to... Go ahead. You know what? Actually, um, this is something that no one ever is not really talking about either. But George Zimmerman's father was a judge. He's a retired yes. judge. But he's a judge. And um, he has exerted his influence several times, as I understand, as I look at media reports. um, And and he also even wrote um, um, an op-ed, and he wrote some letters as well. Um, And so my thing is, I think the, um, and and I think that's one of the reasons, uh, this is my conjecture, but this is, I think this is also one of the reasons why initially that George Zimmerman was not even arrested, because he was the son of a judge. Yeah, there was I I, I thought about that, too. I really think, I think there was a lot of bias, and I think there should have been a change of venue, and I also have problem that um, that I think an outside prosecutor should have been brought in, or there should have been a change of venue in the case as well, because you should have had a pro- it should have been a pro- it should have it shouldn't have been prosecuted um, in that in that area. I don't think it should have been because it, they didn't even want to bring the case to court. They they didn't even want to make the arrest. So how would they even prosecute it effectively? 
Absolutely. And the, other, and the, and the other thing that no one is talking about, going back to, to juror number 37, let's just give her her number, the casualness in which she was, just, you know, was, was saying, Mrs. Zimmerman's name, George. George, just, yes. That's it, that's like she it. empathized with him. That's yes. the impression that I got. As yes. if she knew him. This would take a whole new level. As yes. if she knew this person. Yes. Let's call it a spade a spade. This was a kangaroo court. Yeah, you know that's that's why I brought up Rachel the way I did. So let me clarify: as as the teenager Rachel was on the stand, and Don West, what I was trying to express was as Don West was um, speaking with her. There's a strategy that lawyers use. Um, as he was speaking with her, he was in charge of the um, of the of the hostile witness. And as we watched and saw that she seemed to be of a different culture, that's what he wanted her to look like. That's what a layperson didn't understand. The lawyer was the one in charge of asking her the questions. She wasn't in charge. So he wanted her to look different from the jurors. He wanted her to look ethnically and culturally different so that they could not relate to Rachel. Mm -hmm. And he did that well. That's what I was trying to express. So I want to clarify. He did that very well. The defense attorney, Don West, did an extremely good job. So the jurors could not relate to Rachel. That was my point one, bullet point one. So that correlates to bullet point two, which is she stood in place of Trayvon. Trayvon was on the witness stand is what I was trying to say. Okay. Rachel was you know, wow. You're right about that. So, Even at the so, end, let, can I can I finish one second? That, so then the jurors the end, to clarify. The pictures, so, let me finish one second. So to clarify, so the jurors, what the jurors did was they dismissed. They actually dismissed Trayvon. Do you see at that point? Because they were dismissing what I wanted to say clearly is they were dismissing psychologically Rachel, and in dismissing Rachel, they were then dismissing Trayvon. And that's why they named George as in familiarity, yes. validating George, and that's why his name became a personal name. And mm-hmm. at that point, that's when psychologically you would then know that George was the one they liked. That's what no. I wanted to clarify you know what, about I'm that whole interaction. That's she couldn't fascinating. Relate. The juror even says that she couldn't relate. She didn't couldn't relate, and she didn't try and uh, right. that's Rachel her trustworthy. That's she fact. couldn't relate but, to her. Okay, that's but even after the fact. But as I was watching it, as I was watching it long before that, that's after the fact confirmation, which is not really necessary. But during Don West's interaction with Rachel's, when you immediately, as you do my kind of work, you can tell what's going on mm-hmm. with the jury. With the that is quite disturbing. Well, that, I so, mean, it was a master stroke of the defense, the strategy. Is that what you're saying, Bryn? Well, it happens. This is what happens. When you, when, you, when you go right to the beginning of trial and you're choosing, you're choosing the jury one by one. This, it's a deliberate choice of, at that point when you are doing the trial. You can tell what the jury is going to do. And then when you give the jury instructions and they go and deliberate, you can sort of kind of guess what's going on in deliberation. I'd be interested, I'm interested in to know who, what, what jurors were, uh, were uh, not selected or disqualified because I don't, I'm not going to say they picked them by race. It does look that way. And, and, and I think this verdict was a slam dunk based on, you're saying, based on the jury selection. And I, I want to ask you, ladies, just be honest with me. Do you think the prosecution put on a good case, in your opinion? No. Nope. No. I don't think that they made enough objections. They allowed witnesses to come there. And, and um, for instance, they had one witness who was a friend of George Zimmerman, and he testified as if he was a weapons expert. No one really, no one even really um, um, objected to that testimony. There was another one, a witness, who was a neighbor, and she testified that there was a black burglar in the area. Um, no oh, one really, black I mean, she shouldn't man. even have been allowed. <laughs> they allowed too many people who were character witnesses for George Zimmerman. They did not build um, the case that... Trayvon Martin, I'm in, my background is public relations. So they didn't build um, the char- a character witness for um, Trayvon, on behalf of Trayvon Martin. They didn't tell us 
who he was. They didn't even really. I don't think they reinforced that. that he was there, a child. Yeah, there, there was a reason for that. They 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 didn't want to open up a Pandora's box. Um, right, that was explained. Right. Yeah, that you know, they couldn't the, build. Yeah, go ahead. One of the issues that I saw was that the prosecution missed tremendous opportunities to bring up what what the media had been saying all along was that. The 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 nine one one operator told Zimmerman to not stick to to not get out the car. They didn't they didn't push that enough. They told him uh, uh, to not get out the car. They this young man they, they they talk about the fact that he had a gun. Trayvon didn't have a gun. So what type of what, what who had the power at that point? There was a lot of things that the that the prosecution allowed to slip through their hand and. So, as, as Brian was saying, it shifted on uh, the meaning Trayvon's character, character via yes. Rachel. Okay. Well, uh, okay. I had thought, I agree with both of you totally. However, when I was thinking about the criticism of the prosecution, I was trying to process and brainstorm on behalf of the prosecution. What I came up with was they did... They did have a very difficult case on their hands because they had to prove beyond a reasonable doubt preponderance of the evidence, and they didn't have a lot of evidence. So what they, the strategy they took was with the jury, because it's all about the jury, right? Correct? Mm-hmm. So yes. what they did was they wanted to pull on the heartstrings. This was their strategy, and I thought they did do that. They wanted to pull on the heartstrings of the mothers, and we hey, see women at Brent, can you hold that thought? We got to take our second okay. break. All right. Uh, this, All right. This is Game on Business Talk with Anthony Miles. We'll be right back. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. If you currently or aspire to serve on a board or work in a leadership capacity for or with a public or nonprofit organization, where can you turn to get the best advice and practices? How about Leadership Matters with Dr. Cheryl G. and Jenny Frumer? Our program discusses challenges facing both public and nonprofit leaders. Don't miss these practical solutions and tips to enhance your leadership style and effectiveness. Leadership Matters with Dr. Cheryl G. and Jenny Frumer airs live Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern on the Voice America Business Channel. Are you feeling slammed and suckered in today's stock market? If so, then you need to tune in to Profitable Investing with Jordan Kimmel. Every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, Jordan Kimmel will train you in what you can do to beat up the big boys on Wall Street, as well as share his secrets to success so that you can buy and sell like a profit-pumping pro. Grab the bull market by the horns and listen to Profitable Investing with Jordan Kimmel. Every Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific Time, right here on the bottom line in business talk, Voice America Business. When it comes to business, you'll find the experts here. Voice America Business Network. You are tuned in to Game On Business Talk Radio with Dr. D. Anthony Miles. If you have a question or comment on today's program for Dr. Miles or his guest, please call in to 1-866-472-5790. That's 1-866-472-5790. You may also send an email to GameOnTalkRadio at Yahoo.com. Now, back to the program. Hi, we're back. This is Game On Business Talk, and we're uh, going to continue our discussion on the Zimmerman verdict. And uh, at break, we were talking with uh, Bryn Burkowski. And Bryn, go ahead and make your point. Okay. We were discussing about whether or not the prosecution did a bad job. We, we agreed that the defense had a stronger um, case. However, I wanted to bring up the point that, about the prosecution strategy that I thought was was strong, and I think we agreed on that during break. And the point I was making was that the prosecution decided to go towards the pull in the heartstrings of the mothers on the jury because they were all mothers. And so the prosecution kept on repeating and appealing to the case that Trayvon was a child, a minor, a teenager who was in the neighborhood of his daddy, was allowed to be there. And is it not a minor's worst nightmare? a child's worst nightmare that we parents always tell our children to be mindful of and we tell them what to do. If a creepy person is following you in a car, 
what you should think about, what you should do. And Trayvon definitely was proven that that's what he was thinking, that this creepy person is following me in a car, polite language being used, and mm-hmm. not the kind of language that Rachel told us. And so then the person stopped the car, gets out, by the way, with a gun, and Trayvon, as we know, was scared and frightened, like any child would be. And that's what the prosecution kept on saying. Why? The reason why is because that was their strategy for the jury, for what? Mothers. Mothers to hear. But going back to Rachel, the mothers decided to dismiss who? Trayvon. Based on what? Rachel being who they thought Trayvon was. That's Uh what I have to say. That almost sounds like ethnocentrism. I don't think that they pushed him being a child until closing. I think they did a terrific job on the closing, but I don't think that they pushed it enough during the trial. I think in closing, they did an excellent job at closing, but it was only at closing. I don't think they offered an alternative narrative. I don't think that they did enough with the jo- a good job on the concealed um, harness of the gun, the holster of the gun that was concealed, that was a back holster that no one else could possibly be able to see. And so there were so many, so many holes in, in Zimmerman's story because it was a concealed holster that was under his belt behind him. And so there was a lot that they could have done with that that they didn't do. And then also at the end, um, the um, defense, was allowed to use pictures from Trayvon's um, Trayvon's Facebook, and they were oh, dark, yeah. menacing pictures of that baby. And they were with the grill, uh, with the uh, gold grill, and they were so they were stereotypical pictures that oh, went yeah. and went right back to what I was saying about the otherness and what even, what even Dr. Prokofsky was saying about the otherness. And they even reinforce Rachel Gentile of being otherness and so different, not relatable, and scary. And even the big concrete they brought into the courtroom was, no, yeah, yeah that's probable. Yeah, that's probable because otherness, scary, menacing, darkness. And even the, the pictures were dark that they brought in. And they didn't show, and the, and the prosecution didn't show the nice pictures of Trayvon that I saw on the, on the web. They had great pictures of Trayvon at little NASA camp, the NASA camp that, the year before, where he was helping kids work on airplanes. He was on the Whoa. airplane camp and things like that. Really? So, yeah, wonderful pictures. And I said, why didn't they show these great pictures? Well, it was like the year before. You know, you're speaking of Facebook. There is a uh, a letter that was written by a white father, and they call it they call it the lament of the white father. And basically, in a nutshell, what he was saying was, as a white father, if his son was going to the store at night, they have a fear of his safety, but not to the extent of a black father whose son is going to the store at night. Uh, basically. This man was bringing up the fact that white America has basically dug her head in the ground on the, the realities uh, and fears of black families regarding their sons to the point where Trayvon, although we don't want to see this happen, we didn't want to see this happen to him, the reality of being an African American male it has come full, has become full for uh, full thrust now as to what's going on. We see it in the schools. We see to where the the Trayvon Martin that the, that the, that the defense wants to portray would probably be in a special education classroom versus a gifted and talented classroom. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing where the Trayvon Martins are, are not pushed to to be in. Uh, higher honors courses that may be pushed to be into trade programs or pushed to be playing basketball or football or something like that. So the realities of the African American males and the from a, even from a critical race perspective is that African American males are severely at risk. Yes, right. Yeah. And, yeah. I'm going to share something but with it's, you. It's going to become even more. The, the, the reality is, even as a single parent, that we're going to need more role models, more 
black men to intervene with our African American males because this is a journey that's a hard journey. You know, I don't right. know whether you, I don't know as a mother, you know, when you had your child, when, now I love my son. I love my son to death, but I have to say I had wished he was a girl because as a girl, she might not have gone to some of the changes that my son is going through today. No, nope. I think um, I have a teenage girl, and in her school this year, she got called the N-word three times. It's been yeah, I've oh really my hard God. journey. But you know what? Really? Something it was, I need yeah. to tell you something. That, that's the other thing that was my son. in the United States is that for whatever reason, now uh, this is called a spade of spade here, okay, that mm-hmm. ever since President Barack Obama joined office, it's kind of like the face of racism has totally emerged. It used to be covert. It used to be uh, covert. But it has become so overt, so it's absolutely ridiculous. I, to where you've got, yeah. you've got Paula Dean. She's yeah. using the N-word. Something that we haven't heard about or discussed is two African-American females in Houston, Texas, were going home, were going wherever they were going, not bothering us, so they got pulled over. And the police officer thought he smelled marijuana in the car, right? Pulled the girls over, and they were physically assaulted by the police officers on a cavity check. Hmm. So, oh, my. I thought I that was against the law for them to do that. Right. You've got um, on, right. on Big Brother, you've got people on, on TV that's going off using racial epithets. We have never, I don't think we have seen racism emerge right. as much as we have except under this presidency. And I don't know whether it's a frustration, it's a rea- you know, maybe the, I don't know, the frustrated. I don't even know what it's going to say it's because uh, we're having limited resources, because our resources are becoming very limited, right? But yes. racism wow. has totally gone off the charts in this, in this, uni- in this United States, more and than people, I have ever seen in my lifetime. And people deny, and, and I think that's part of the frustration, too, that there is a, a denial of that experience or that truth. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, well, a, my, that's a major yeah. part of it, that people say, well, no, that doesn't, that doesn't exist mm-hmm. anymore. Are you kidding? And we're saying, well, yes, it does every day. I've had to take my children out of a private Christian school because they said that Barack Obama was a, um, was a radical terrorist. <laughs> Who needed to be oh assassinated, and that came oh. from, you know, that and that was okay. That was okay to say. I mean, it's, it, this is crazy. The yeah. Voting Rights Act being changed at this point. But, you know, for, for us, you know, we no. may not really see, but for our kids, the full implications probably will not be realized until they have until later on. Yeah. Within well, the last two weeks, we have rolled back many of the human rights that we have achieved in 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 the sixties. Yeah. In the well, last can I, two weeks, yeah. look, looking for something. we have ten minutes. We, we, looking for some solutions, right? Well, as I'm listening to you, my my children are now. My son is 24, and my daughter is 21, and they they have had racism happen throughout their lifetime. And when they were much younger, as their mother, I didn't tell them that that's what they were experiencing because they were maybe four years old and three years old, but. They have been experiencing it their whole lifetime, and it hasn't increased. It stayed the same. I've experienced it here in the United States as police officers stopping me. When I was at Johns Hopkins University, when I was at Maryland Law School, police officers stopped me. Um, at times, when I worked for the sheriff's department, police officers stopped me, and then I reported it to the sheriffs, and the police officers were embarrassed. They were told not to profile me, as they did. So I've had all those experiences here in this country, also in Europe. Um, but, however, with the solutions, um, do you know about restorative justice? Have you heard about restorative justice? No, I have not. No. Okay. All right. And then, of course, you know about community policing. Community yes. policing. Okay. Um, our President Obama was talking about, um, in relation to the Zimmerman case, was talking about solutions. And you brought up some, um, both of you, brought up some solutions as you're speaking right now. And I thought to bring up restorative justice because a lot of professionals speak about restorative justice who know about it, but they don't truly understand it. And they speak of it as though they understand it, but they they don't. It takes quite a while to truly wrap your mind around it. There are only about three countries in the world who practice it. 
one country through Desmond Tutu practice it for a short period of time to heal the Burundi um, Rwanda situation just for a small period of time. England practices it in some communities. Newfoundland practices it in some communities, and Canada practices it a little bit, but that's it. And it does work, but what it is is that it's a view of crime being against a community rather than a state. That's the definition. So restorative justice is a view of crime being against the community rather than the state. As we have it in the U.S., we don't do restorative justice, but some professionals think we do. And that's within the legal system we don't do it. It doesn't mean that we would change our legal system. Our legal system would stay the same. It's just that we would add to it. And in adding to it, it would cost us much more money. And that's probably one of the reasons we do not do it in the U.S., because it would cost taxpayers more money. So in a case like this, with the Trayvon Martin case, at this point in time, restorative justice would come into play to heal the community, and every stakeholder would get involved. Every stakeholder would now begin to talk to community members, including Rachel. Everybody would come together and heal. But well, we're going to have be- to close there because we're, we're getting oh. down to our time. And I want to say that uh, you three ladies have really touched me with some of the uh, comments in our discussion and some things I, I was not aware of. And I'm trying to think forward what this country needs to do. And we'll definitely have to bring you back for I think we should have a follow up show on this. But that's our show for today. I want to thank our guest, Bryn Burkowski. Dr. Sharon Chadwell, and Dr. Velma Gooding. I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. You're welcome. All, all righty. Thank you. Thank you let very me much. Give, let me give my quote for the week, and I think it's appropriate for this particular show. Usually when people are sad, they don't do anything. They just cry over, the condition, over their condition. But when they get angry, they bring about a change. Anonymous. Well, I'm out of here. This is Game on Business Talk with DeAnthony Miles. I will see you next week. Take care. Thank you again for listening to Game on Business Talk Radio. Please join your host, Dr. DeAnthony Miles, again next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific Time and 12 noon Eastern Time on the Voice America Business Channel. We'll engage in more unique and exciting discussion topics then. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Business Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericabusiness.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network.